Poverty is not just the absence of money, but the absence of opportunity. And the United States is a country where you have both freedom and abundant opportunities. I'm moving to the United States as giving me both. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knit family. I was the third of four children. And the best thing that my parents gave me was the gift of education. Even though I came from a poor family, they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. But what my parents did was that they instilled in us the value of faith, hard work, and not giving up. They made us realize that if you put in the work, you will definitely get the reward. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. I got my first job at the age of 14. My job was on a construction site. My duties were to move concrete on a large pan from one end of the construction site to another one. I worked on that day from around six in the morning to about seven at night. At the end of the day, the employer refused to pay me. And the reason was because she did not authorize the foreman to hire me. So I worked from sunup to sundown and didn't get paid. That tore up my spirit. And from that moment on, I decided that I was going to become a lawyer. And I was going to use every ounce of strength within me to fight against injustice, regardless of how powerful the opponent is. I am a man that worked my way up from nothing. I know what it means to feel like you're being unfairly treated. And I'm the person that can stand up to opponents regardless of how big or how powerful they are. Welcome to this episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel Olawale. I have a special friend with me today. His name is Steven Rue. He is an attorney from Louisiana. He's known as the Southern Fried Lawyer. Welcome to the show, Steven. Thank you so much. I'm just so honored and it's a privilege to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you. Can you tell us who Steven Rue is? Well, my name's Steven Rue. I'm a, an attorney in the greater New Orleans area. I practice throughout Louisiana. And we do personal injury, family law, and criminal defense. I have practiced for over 30 years. I have an MBA law degree. I did some postgraduate work in leadership and negotiation in Harvard Law. I'm working on uh, with the hope of getting admitted to the doctorate program in leadership studies. And I'm a certified life coach. I very much believe in helping people. It's extremely important to me. My values are centered around the fact that so many of us, most of us, have some sort of tragedy and problems that we face in our lives. I did. When I was very young, my father and my mother divorced. And then uh, my father wasn't in my life the rest of my life, literally. He died a few years ago at age 80 and I didn't really know my father. He didn't want to know us. And then my mother remarried to a doctor and he became essentially our father. And what happened there was I loved him so much. He was a great man. But one day, many years ago, he put a gun in his mouth and killed himself. I've never said this before, but it has tore it tore my mother up so much she basically had a nervous breakdown i was the only son the eldest child i had a younger sister and we had to learn how to live with a mother who was broken for quite some time thank goodness she's alive and much better now but she's in her mid 80s and very frail but she's the biggest superhero I have ever had because she struggled then to deal with life and became a school teacher and helped children 
for decades and, and put us through school, put us through all of our education, law school, and has been extraordinarily supportive. And through that pain, I learned that I wanted to help people because I realized that so many people are in pain, whether it be from a loss of a loved one, from being injured or crippled in some fashion, um, from people going through a divorce and fighting over custody of their children, people involved in victim, their victims of domestic violence, people who have gotten themselves in a bad situation with drugs and have been arrested and they need a, uh, some sort of a representation because they need help. And I like to help them to turn the, their lives around. But I think being a lawyer on who Stephen Rue is, it's much more than just going to court. It's if you gain the wisdom, and I'm a self-improvement junkie. I've done the Tony Robbins. I've done the, the crisp uh, law office management. I've done so many things. I've read so many books, including this beautiful book right here. And we learn from other people, and we try to model the best of everyone. And we learn that we're all fragile, and yet we need each other. We truly need each other. And it's okay to be fragile. It's okay to cry. It's okay to say, I love you. It's okay to say that you're enough. It's okay not to be perfect because none of us are. And so I like as a lawyer to try to help people. I try to coach them in their lives. I try to let them change their personal narrative of who they are. Let's erase. I, I tell them what, how do you describe yourself in manual they may say well i'm uh, you know I, i'm i'm a loser i'm a victim or whatever whatever they want to say that is nothing but limiting beliefs for themselves it doesn't serve them well in their lives and for those who they love and it may support so i like to try to do in old school terms an etch a sketch shake it up erase that image and let's create a new image. And if you need to put on a cape and to have a personification and to, you know, fake it till you make it, well, that's fine as long as you are true to who you are. So I try to help a lot of people do that because, and I, and I rationalize, I guess, to say, Emmanuel, that I'm being a good lawyer for my clients because I try to be a lawyer centered lawyer and a, we have a lawyer. I'm sorry, no, I didn't mean lawyer, I meant client-centered. I'm a client-centered lawyer, and it's a client-centered law firm. And in order to do that, we try to help our clients as much as humanly possible to get through this experience. Because what's happening is, if they're knocking on my door and wanting an appointment, they're likely going through one of the worst times of their entire lives. They need help. They don't just need a lawyer, but they need someone that's going to be there for them in all the 360 aspects of their life 360 degrees of their being and we try to help them in that regard we take that extraordinarily serious in my firm and i have rationalized that if i can help them be a happier more fulfilled more content person going in the right direction then they can be a better client they can be a better party litigants and whatever they are, whether it's a personal injury, family law, criminal case, whatever kind of case it is, they can come out improved in some fashion. And I believe in continuing never ending change. So, and that is who Stephen Rue is, Emmanuel. Thank you for asking. Continuing ever ending change. Yes. And uh, yeah, you mentioned the tragedy that kind of forms you. I think you were about 12 years old when that tragedy happened. That's true. Yes. How old was it for you? Because that's the age where you are not, you're in between preteens. You're getting into that age where your body starts to change, where you start to become a mini man. And for that yeah. kind of tragedy to happen at that point in your life, how did it affect you i did not really old. have i didn't really have much of a male role model i had a wonderful uncle who's been supportive all of our lives but he lived in new orleans and at the time 
uh, we lived in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where my stepfather committed suicide. So he did the best he could, but finally we moved back to New Orleans and he was more supportive, but he had a life too. And so being a 12 year old boy without a, a father figure was very t tough. I actually felt I had to be the man of the family. And that meant I had to be strong. I had to take over the male role for the household. My mother, I'm sure, didn't feel that way, but I felt that way. I could not cry at my stepfather's funeral. And I didn't cry for several years until one day my uncle came over and we had a long talk and I just kept on, I, I started to weep. He says, what's wrong? And it came to me, I said, you know, I finally feel like there's another man here that I can take a pause, I can take a break and someone else can make sure the family's okay. And I was bullied after my father died as a, as a child. So guess what I do now? I can't stand bullies. And, uh, and tr people try to bully people in the courtroom. They will rue the day because I will make sure <laughs> that that doesn't happen. I've worked very, very hard to be a superb litigator, a surgeon in the courtroom, and I will not let anyone be bullied. It also made me try to figure out why are people the way they are and what we can do to help each other. I became very creative, like my mother's a painter, and now I, as a hobby, um, I'm a serious painter, I sculpt, and um, I love the creative, aspect of life. Uh, hence, you got some blue glasses on right now. And, uh, but people go, what's up with those blue glasses? Well, I like them. And that's the answer. You know, I'm not terribly concerned if people like them or not. Guess what? I like them. But I do hope you like them. I but I, 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 I believe that we all need to be ourselves. And we need to find a way to help each other. And I tell you, when I met you, I found you to be such a genuine, wonderful person. And I'm so proud and honored to know you. I truly, because you are the type of lawyer that we need throughout the country and the world. You truly are. And you are a blessing, Emmanuel. Thank you. And, and, and so are you. And Thank you, my friend. Says the man who turns his personal pain to power and empowering other people and standing up against the bullies. And so at the age of 12, when that happened, you, I know a few years later, you started high school. What was high school like for you? It was actually very nice. We, my mother, despite the fact that we were, uh, she was struggling, she had to uh, um, tutor people to make enough money to put us through school. And uh, we did well in school. And I just, I loved, I loved to sing. I was in the choir and I had a lot of good friends. I didn't have any problems really in, in high school. Someone tried to bully me and I was, was starting to get bigger at the time. And I remember the first day of class and I was like a, a, a sophomore in high school. And this particular uh, gentleman, he, he and I, he was, we were both boys at the time, of course. Um, tried to bully me and I've had enough about being bullied. So I literally first day of school went up to him and I grabbed him and, and for, I was able to do it. I don't know how I was able to do it, but I lifted him up in the air, hit him against this wall and says, you will not bully me this year. Do you understand that? Things changed after then. <laughs> and, uh, I've kind of been that way ever since, not mm. physically uh, confrontational, but uh, standing up for myself and for others. Sure Recently, awesome. uh, you know, people go, well, what's this Southern fried lawyer thing? Well, yes. People call me the Southern fried lawyer. Uh, one day I was in court and I was representing this literally a, a rock and roll star, literally from uh, Detroit. And I had a case against that person's uh, spouse, former spouse. 
and uh, we did very well that day. And the spouse came up to my client after and said, that's Stephen Rue, he's a Southern fried MFR. He actually used a different word than that, but uh, that changed to be a little bit more genteel and everyone started to call me the Southern fried lawyer. So I'm starting my own podcast. I'm writing a book called The Southern Fried Lawyer. I have southernfriedlawyer.com. And I want to write a book about how we as lawyers and other people in the world, all of us can help other people and how to appreciate the blessings in our life and live a life of abundance for everyone else. And that's the highest life that we can live for others. To serve others is in that and to improve and to have progress, that is what true happiness is about and true purpose. Serving others is what true happiness and true purpose is all about. Wow. Yes. That's deep fried. <laughs> That's deep fried, huh? <laughs> Extra crispy. Yes. So, so when did you realize that you wanted to become a lawyer? My uncle was a lawyer. At first, I had no idea wanted, what I wanted to do or be. A lot of us, when we're young, we go to school, some of us go to college, and sometimes we listen to what others say. Well, you should be this, you should be that. And I had no idea. I, I thought I was going to be a business person. I got an MBA, and uh, but I didn't know. My uncle was a and is a, a well-known lawyer in the greater New Orleans area. So I said, well, I'm going to be like my uncle. And so I... I uh, I went to law school and actually the true story is that my sister is also a lawyer and because I got my MBA and we're two years, two and a half years apart, we went to school at the same time. She went to Tulane, I went to Loyola. And my whole family goes, oh, it's a Steven, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if you're gonna make it. Well, I showed everyone, I showed, including myself because I ended up number 13 in the class out of over 200. And so I was extremely, um, you know, proud of that and continued to do well. And I got my first job halfway through law school. I worked for a federal judge. And then when I got out, I worked for a firm that was representing Lloyd's of London. And I hated it. I hated it because I felt what I was doing was, was trying to use my legal skills to deprive people of compensation that they deserved. In a particular case, a barge exploded and a man was killed. And my job was to try to how to diminish the amount of money that the widow was to receive. I couldn't do that. I actually knew that job wasn't right for me. I, I aired my discontentment about it. And surprise, surprise, I was terminated. The best thing that ever happened to me but I had no money. So what did I do? I started working out of my small apartment and I didn't know how I was gonna make a living at all. And then there was this old steak and egg restaurant. Literally, it's where I'm sitting in right now it was an old steak and egg restaurant. It had orange plastic furniture in it. It had steel grills where people would do omelets and things of that nature. And I saw it as a canvas that I could do something with. I didn't have hardly any money. I, I raised some money and there was an elderly man that owned it. So I, I went to him and said, sir, would you consider owner financing this? It had been boarded up for several years, but it's on a major thoroughfare. He goes, sure, I'll do that. So what did I do? I, I, I bought it with a, a few thousand dollars that I had and was paying the gentleman every month. And we took out the orange furniture. I sold the, um, the grills to somebody that wanted the used grills. And then I, we built out the office, but I couldn't afford an apartment and to build out the office too. So for a year and a half, I lived in the back room of this very building, an old steak and egg. And that was over 30 years ago. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you got to do what so, you got to do, you know? Wow. 
It's okay. So, wow. So that I've edge. seen worse things than that. Most people have. Wow. You have. So you, you turned a restaurant into your law office. Yeah. A steak and egg restaurant. That's right. Yeah. What was it like to be living at the back of that restaurant? I had to build a shower in, in, in the bathroom so I could shower every 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 day. So it was it was quite interesting, you know. Um, back in the day when I was single, I, I would go out sometimes, and sometimes I would have a few cocktails. And I got up a little later than I should have, and had people in the co in the uh, waiting area, and there I was just getting out of bed trying to hustle. But uh, those days are long and gone. But it's kind of fun to remember them at this point. What was your typical day like at that time? Risk, taking risk. I remember the phone book, which is now a dinosaur, the Yellow Pages, was one of the major sources of advertising at the time. So I uh, went to the Yellow Pages, the local Yellow Pages, and I tried to get the biggest ad I could. So what I did is I got a full page ad and I got the back of the phone book full page as well. It would cost me a fortune that I did not have. But I decided, Stephen, I'm going to go be, be successful as a independent lawyer, my own business person, or I'm going to go bankrupt. And there were many, 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 many months that I had to pay things with multiple credit cards because I didn't have any cash. It's not as easy as people think all the time. I, I There's many times that I didn't have a lot of money to go out and buy new clothes or food or whatever, but that was okay. And slowly but surely, I started to be able to pay my bills and grow my practice and hire staff and hire attorneys and build a reputation and and from that grit came success and prosperity and after i got to a certain level of success and and comfort for lack of a better term i turned myself inward to personal development i went to all of the tony robbins seminars i read i've read hundreds and hundreds of personal development books and books on how to build a, a good business. And I learned from that. I reflected on it. I've written several books myself. I've written five books on legal issues, but now I'm writing a book about how we can help each other and how we can live better lives as lawyers and as other, other, other people in the world. Um, and I want to impart whatever wisdom that God has given me through the education that you talked about in the intro, our, our education is so terribly valuable to us. I do believe that we all should continue to educate ourselves as much as humanly possible throughout our entire lives and then use that education, use that wisdom, use that experience to improve the lives of others. So in the last few years, that has become paramount to me. That has become my ultimate goal in life is to live a good life with my loved ones, with my family, with my friends, and with the strangers that I love. And to improve everyone's life as much as I humanly possibly can. And I certainly still all continue to make mistakes and, and, and have failures and, and, things that we have to learn from and go forward. You know, that's what we need to do. Regardless of our circumstances, our past does not equate to who we are. Our future hasn't helped happen yet. So what we need to do in my view is count our blessings. I'm a spiritual person. I pray every day. I also look at what I can do to that 1% that well, there's a saying that we uh, recently saw at a seminar that we went to said better than yesterday. Well, yes, I want to yeah. be better than yesterday. Every day. 
And that doesn't mean just for myself. That means to better be able to help others. And at the end of the day that I did something good, that is my legacy. My legacy hopefully will be the improvement on everyone else's lives that I've touched. And I, and I know that sounds very, um, I don't know, kind of self-centered in a way, but I don't know how else to be other than to try to display love. When my stepfather died, it, may, it was a critical time and a motivating factor in my life. And um, on his recent 50th anniversary of his death, I had to make a video on that day. And I said what I want to say now to everyone that's listening and, and or watching, that you are loved. You are enough. You can be exactly whoever you want to be. That don't limit yourself. Don't define yourself on the past. Tell yourself, who does God want you to be? And then be that person. Act in that way. Help other people. You know what to do. It's in you intuitively. You know this. It's your inner voice. That's God whispering in your ear saying, he wants you to be the best you you could be. And if I can help just a few people out there in my life, it makes me feel good. And I want to help those people. It's actually very selfish to give because you get a lot of return. We get a lot in return, although that's not the primary motivation, but it's true. It's absolutely true. You know, we all have injuries in our life, our traumas in our life that we've talked about during this podcast. And what I have learned is that sometimes we, as we get older and more mature, can need to take the time to help heal ourselves. Years ago, I was at a seminar and, and it suggested that you find the, the time in your life that you were the most hurt, the most damaged. Remember that child, that boy, that girl that was so hurt back then. Know who you are now, that you are okay, that you are much better now, and that you have the ability to be self-determinative of who you want to be in life. Close your eyes. I close my eyes. Go back to that child and talk to that child. Hold that child. And I did in my mind. Closed my eyes and said, Steve, I was known as Steve back then. Steve, you're okay. You're okay. I'm here for you. Come with me. Come with me now. I'm here to protect you. I'm your older self. You're no longer in need to be in pain. That moment was one of the most um, freeing moments of my life. Because I took that inner hurt child of myself. and was that father figure to myself, was that parent to myself. I said to my younger self, I love you, you're enough, you're fine. Now come with me, and then let's go help others. That's what I did. You know, I used the word okay another time. I know I'm kind of freely speaking here, but I hope, thank you for listening. <laughs> My great grandmother, I mean, my grandmother, her name was Meemaw. Meemaw and Pops were my grandparents. Meemaw was on her deathbed, literally, very frail. She was a petite woman. The night that I knew she was going to die, she needed someone to help suck um, 
the phlegm out of her, out of her throat. And so it was my time to do that. And I was at her bedside and was doing the phlegm. She could not talk, could not move, but I'm convinced that she could hear me. And I said, it's okay. It's okay, Mima. I love you. It's okay. It's okay. At night I left and my mother took my place at her bedside. Later that night she died. And so the same thing that I said to myself, I said to my grandmother, and I will say to each, of, each and every one of you now, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to be just fine. Believe in that. If you're so focused on sadness, then you're focused on the wrong thing because we have so many blessings. And if we focus on the beautiful sky, the wind, the cool breeze on our face, the family members that may love us, and not focus on those negative things that we easily can talk and think about, that negative inner voice that talks to us, we need to shift our thinking that this is a beautiful world and that we can be beautiful people to help other beautiful people of all shapes and sizes, of all colors, of all nationalities, etc. We're all human beings. It's okay. We're okay. We're okay. We yes, are. wow. That is very empowering. How, you know, at the age of six, you lost your biological father to separation. Yeah. Six years later, you lost your adopted father yeah. to suicide. These are just series of pain. How were you able to transform this pain to purpose and spread love the way you are? Well, I have a little side book I'm working on called Fading Fathers. Because my two fathers faded out of my existence. Yes, but still, did. you have you know some memories of it. Six years apart. I have had great anger for my father through all of my adult life. I even tried to reach out in uh, the latter part of his last few years, but he would not respond to me. He uh, professed to be a big Christian and things like that, but he couldn't even talk to his only son. When he died, my sister and I weren't even in his obituary as being his children. I met my two half sisters, my biological father's daughters from another marriage and who were lovely people. We, 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 we love each other. We get along superbly now and uh, I'm blessed to have them in my lives and I hope they feel the same way. They invited me to the funeral and I had to go despite the fact I hadn't had a relationship because I had to declare to the world at, at his gravesite that we existed, that we were in fact his children as well. And they had cremated his body. We, I met my sisters at, um, at a restaurant in, here in Louisiana and we had to travel to Mississippi to bury him and I said well where where is where is dad he said well he's his ashes are in the trunk we have to go find something to bury him in and i'm thinking we have to what yes we actually went to a home goods store it's pretty sur surrealistic when you are meeting your adult half sisters that are both over 50 years old for the first time and then we are going to a home goods to try to find some kind of container to put my father's ashes in. We ultimately found something. And then in the parking lot, my uh, eldest half sister went into the, went into the, uh, the trunk, lifted up my father's ashes and without thinking, just kind of placed them in my arms. And I felt the heaviness of his ashes in my arms. And it took me by surprise and just, I, um, I started crying. Some of the ashes went into the air. 
because that was the closest, that was the first time I hugged my father since I was six years old. I was hugging his ashes. And I had hated him that whole time because he had abandoned us. And then it hit me like God whispering in my ear. You can't be mad at ashes. No, you can't be mad at ashes. And at that moment, my anger left. And I realized that who was putting that anger in myself that whole time was not anyone but myself. We hold these resentments when we need to let them go. We are, that's part of our, our personal narrative, our story that we are allowing this hurt to percolate into anger, to percolate into negative stuff, to percolate into uh, whether it be substance abuse or, or how you treat other people or, or just how you define yourself. And that needed to, that needed to be, like I said, a race, like a etch a sketch. And my life through that pain has been a process of dealing with pain and learning that everyone else has pain. Wow, I tell you, when you learn that everyone else has pain, everyone else has trauma, everyone else has problems, everyone else has fears, everyone else doesn't know what's gonna happen, has worries about finances and health and whether someone is loved, et cetera, it brings us all to that same level of existence, of humanity, of that's why we should love each other. When you go through a lot of pain, like I know you have too, Emmanuel, and we know a lot of people, everyone has gone through this pain in some fashion, in some shape, at some time. Very few people go without pain. It's inevitable. That's part of life. But it's how we deal with it, right? It's how we deal with our problems. How we look at our problems. Are they or make them lessons? Learn from our pain. Learn from our failures. Quote failures because they're not. They're just part of life. If everything went our way, I guess it would be a pretty boring existence, wouldn't it? But at the end of the day. We have to learn from our experiences, and that's what I try to do. Thank you. And when you decided to uh, start your own practice, how did you decide what areas to focus on? I always wanted to be a big personal injury attorney, and I've had many multi-million dollar cases. I helped um, a family in tremendous need when five children were killed in, um, in, in a car accident. I was there when elderly people were killed in a bus accident in which the seats literally came together, the metal came together side by side by side. I was in that bus. I saw the glasses on the ground, literally a Bible was on the ground. I've been in those circumstances again I know that there's people that pain. I've seen other people's pain. And having that commonality, it helps you be a better lawyer when you understand pain as well, when you understand loss. Grieving is something that we can't tell how other people to grieve. We can't do that. That's not within the realm of our ability or realm of our propriety. Everyone grieves in their own way. And then I started to do a lot of family law because <laughs> dysfunctional family, I wanted to help people that were in the realm of that dysfunction, whether it be a simple divorce or whether it be uh, custody battles and truly looking after what is the best interest of children. I wanna say while I have this ability to talk to people that I think that all lawyers in the family law field really need to not bolster themselves at the sake of these children. 
not to fight overly heavy at the sake of children. The lawyers need to work together with the court system to do what's in the best interest of children and also help parents understand they need to stop hating each other and looking after what is truly the best thing for each of the child, children that they have together. They don't have to like each other, although they need to grow up and, 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 and become parents. They need to be good co-parents that we need to find a way to make the existence of those children less traumatic. And so I really started to do that. And people came in for all other types of, of, of uh, practice and we did a lot of that as well. But the personal injury and family law has been the primary focus of our practice for a very long time. And we are very selective on who we take on family law and we are very aggressively uh, helping a lot of people who with traumatic injuries and, and unfortunately deaths. And we continue to do that and I want to do that as long as I have the ability to do so. Thank you. Thank did you. you how, how did you develop the philosophy with which you run your practice? Because it seems like you've made what happened to you as a child that formed the person you are you've made it as a purpose to also help to alleviate other people's pain. How did you f formulate the philosophy? At one time when I was a child, I thought about being a minister, but I had decided I was too hedonistic and materialistic to do so. And as time has evolved and as I have matured, uh, being a minister probably would have been a pretty good thing for me, but I think that we all can be ministers in life, whether we're ordained or not. And Correct. so um, I, I actually am an ordained minister, but I, I don't preach in front of a church. Uh, but I want to uh, do my personal preaching as much as I can everywhere I humanly possibly can. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's what I do. and and. Uh, that's who I am. Yeah. So you just use your office as your pulpit. Yes, it's my pulpit. It truly is. Uh, and some some people don't want lawyers like me. Some people want very dry lawyers that uh, you know that don't care about their clients and just push papers and just do things surgically without the caring. Well, then they need to find someone else. And, and in fact, I, I pray there are not very many lawyers like that because I think that all lawyers need to come behind, get away from behind that curtain, that Wizard of Oz and come out and meet Dorothy and the Scarecrow and, and talk honestly that we're all human beings. Let's see what we can do to help you. Um, we as lawyers sometimes wanna stay behind that curtain and be that Wizard of Oz and not let people know who we truly are because we're afraid they'll find us to be frauds or something. Well, you're not a fraud if you're letting everyone know your frailties and, and, and who you are. I, I think authenticity is the best realistic way to practice law that there is. And I frankly think that you're gonna get more clients and better quality of law practice if you are a human being in the practice of law. Stop just being this lawyer. We all have to retire. We're much more than just lawyers. My goodness. Those who define themselves exclusively as lawyers without any other personal narrative in their story are gonna be very depressed when they retire because they're not gonna know who they are. So if anyone listening is in that direction Take a break and look at yourself and say, who are you? Who do you want to be? Who should you be? And be that person and not just be that cloak of a lawyer that at the end of the day, we hang up these suits and ties. We don't go to court anymore. You can be a better lawyer being a human being. And that's what I want to espouse as much as humanly possible. Thank you. And you are reputed for being authentic your, yourself. You don't really care about what people think. 
and you know you're known for your there, blue glasses i used to a lot i used to have that spotlight complex that everything people are always thinking about Stephen rue or people are always thinking about me people don't have time to think about you people don't have time to think about me they're thinking too much about themselves and their own problems it's extremely egotistical to think that you're the focus of anyone else i used to think that i really did i'm not proud of that i'm not proud of that at all but guess what i'm not that person anymore i don't define myself in, in that fashion anymore i learned that was part of my defense mechanism because i felt abandoned as a child because i felt i had to be strong and i had to be a certain way that wasn't the way that was my turtle shell protecting myself and i was sticking my head in the sand from reality of being vulnerable to my own pain and to dealing with it so that's what i have done i took my head out i poked my head out of the shell and said this is nonsense stop living a life with the intent and need of significance which is uh, uh, essentially at the end of the day a very non-rewarding need of our human needs and let's try to evolve into caring about other people having certainty and uncertainty in our life we need both but we also need to have love and affection and we have to have contribution to others that's the highest level of our personal growth is to get beyond our ego to to leave that and to find a way to help other people I and there's a book people. called the obstacle is the way and it deals with the issue of we all have obstacles we all have tragedies we all have these problems but if you don't have these problems if you don't have this pain you can't learn from it you can't grow from it you you have to take advantage of these times of sadness of hurt and realize it's temporal meaning this too shall pass if i told my father when he put a gun in his mouth dad don't do that take the gun out of your mouth we love you this too will pass then the next day had he not killed himself he probably would have realized i was just down i should i'm fine and he might be here today so we need to understand that these things are will pass if we let them but we need to learn from it and then hopefully evolve that continuing never-ending improvement and that's what i try to do i become try to become more enlightened every day i gotta tell you i devour books i devour audible books audio books i listen to them constantly and there is not a day that i don't read or listen that i don't n learn something new the reality of it is we don't know what we don't know and so we get in this rut of thinking we know so much well that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of a narrative of who we are sometimes you got to peek over the rut and say hey wait there are things out here beyond our comfort low comfort zone that we need to get into we need to lean into our uncomfortableness to grow we need to learn how to be comfortable about being uncomfortable because that's the only way that we can grow muscle or anything and generally it's incremental meaning i started running marathons when i was 40. i'm not an athlete but all these jocks were talking to the girls and saying um yeah yeah i run marathons well, I said, I said, you know i'm gonna do that well since then i've run 14 marathons seven new york marathons and i learned one thing know how you run a marathon a step at a time as you well know emmanuel how do you write a book a word at a time don't focus on that big staircase and go oh i, I don't know if i can make it don't focus on 26.2 miles oh i don't think i can make it focus on that one step focus on that one word focus on that incremental change that you can actually make progress because progress is happiness and every day if we're better than yesterday 
Every day that we, if it increase a fraction of 1%, your life will be exponentially improved. We have to look at, I, I wear, and I'm going to show you, a medallion. It's Tibetan. And it's right here. Well, that's my cross. Here is my medallion. And it's a circle. And what it symbolizes to me is that we have to be well-rounded individuals in all of the various aspects of our lives. What are the aspects of our lives? Well, we have family and friends and acquaintances. We have spiritual. We have financial. You know, what about our job? We have our physical fitness and health. All of these aspects of our life, we have to try to be as well-centered as possible because it's like cogs on a wheel. If a part of our life is out of balance with the rest, then your whole cart is going to go like this. Your life is not going to be balanced. So we need to continually focus on, in my view, how to improve all of those areas of our life, our relationships with our loved ones, our relationships with people we don't know, our spiritual and religious relationship, um, our physical fitness, our financial. All of those things come together into our being in our in our um, ability to be the type of success that we want to be. You have to be. So that's what I'm perpetually trying to do and also help people with. Thank you. And you'll soon be starting your own podcast known as the Southern Fried Lawyer Podcast. The the Southern Mm -hmm. Fried Lawyer Podcast, yes. Yes. Tell us about uh, the people podcast. seem to like that that name, so I'm going to adopt it. Uh, we have a federal trademark coming on it too, actually. Um, but I guess I'm going to be the Southern Fried Lawyer, and in that, I'm going to be use my life coach, my uh, education, my leadership studies, and to try to help not only lawyers become more human in their practice and in their lives, but other people too. And I'm really looking forward to it. I hope that you will be on my podcast in the future, Emmanuel, because you yourself, sir, are such an inspiration of not only motivation, but of discipline and of caring and of love. You, you, sir, are a wonderful human being that I am blessed to know. You thank truly you. are. You as well. Thank and you. yeah, thank you. Sometimes during your career, you ran for lieutenant governor of Louisiana. I did. I ran for lieutenant governor. And then I was actually doing quite well. And then the situation happened that the United States senator's brother decided to run. Well, guess what? I did not win that election. <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of like that Garth Brooks song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Hmm. Because when I look at it at the end of the day, I feel blessed that I did not become lieutenant governor. I guess it would bring me down a different path, and you never know what that would be. But I'm quite happy with where I am now and my ability to serve other people and i um back in the day when i ran for lieutenant governor i still had that desire of significance i guess i still do because we all have a certain level of desire for a need of significance but it mine is much more uh modulated at the moment and in, in my life and uh i'm very i'm thrilled with the prospect of every day getting up and trying to help somebody that to me is uh, a blessing from god to me it really is and you have this i i don't even know how to describe it this die hard work ethic anything (laughs) you put your mind into you go all the way in 
never leading anything out. Yeah. I've, I've witnessed it first and so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> where, where did that drive come from? Uh, that drive came from my mother. I have the same drive as my mother. My mother, as I mentioned earlier, Jeannie Rue Pearson is her name. Again, she's my hero, but she fought for everything in her life. She struggled and was persistent and would not accept no as an answer and said, "What? how do I get there? What do I do? How can I improve this for my children? I guess I didn't fall far from that tree. And she's been a wonderful role model in that aspect of my life. You know, we look at people that may have had struggles in their life because of the pains that they've endured. My mother is one of those individuals. When, years ago, she struggled with alcohol. She doesn't anymore. And she hasn't in many, many years. But what she survived that. She went through that. She penetrated that pain and came out on the other side of it. And during all that time, she was raising two kids on her own while in tremendous pain and not knowing how to pay the bills and all the worries. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced there were days and nights of uh, sleepless nights, worrying, worrying, worrying about the next morning, the next day, the next month, the next few years on how to deal with things. And when someone can stand up after being knocked down many times, and then do what they did to put two children through law school. That is a superhero. And I can't be less than who I am because if I were to be less than who I want to be, then I would not be honoring all of the pain and suffering and dedication and discipline that my mother has, has endured in her life so that mine and my sisters could be better. So that is why I am who I am. I proudly say I am my mother's son. You are your mother's son. That's yes. indeed. And you have been the father for yourself, raising yourself. Well, I, well you know, it's, but the reality, I say I was a father to myself back then, that's how I thought. But the truth of the matter is, guess who the father was this whole time? It was God. God. God has been my father. God has been my leader. God has been my inspiration. God has given me the, the um, attributes to, to be who I am at this moment. So... You know, although I, I did say and that, you know, I had to be my own father, the reality of it is, and I've come to this um, breakthrough um, a few years ago that God, I'm, I'm Christian, so Jesus, God has been my father. He's my father in every single way possible. I have a stepfather now who's been with my mother for many years, and he's been a, a great human being and a man. But who's been my father is my God. I think we need to be fathers to each other and, and human beings to our each other, parents to each other, brothers and sisters to each other. We're all somewhat related, no matter what we look like. And, you know, I, you know, we talk about politics. You know who I am? I'm Switzerland. I don't talk politics because I think that divides. And um, it doesn't define who you are because we all are not lawyers. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. We're not independents. You know, we're not Baptists or Muslim or, or, or whatever. We are human beings on this earth. Cool. Yes, we have various flavors and colors and sizes. That's what makes life beautiful, isn't it? So I think it's okay to say to each of us that you're okay. 
And guess what we can say too? To ourselves. I'm okay. Each of us can say, I'm okay. I'm okay, Steve. I'm okay, Emmanuel. I'm okay, Jane. I'm okay, Sue. I'm okay, John. I'm okay. We are okay. And we're definitely going to be much better and better all right and okay together than we would be apart. Yes, we are okay. How can people reach you? Well, um, I have a website, stephenrue.com, um, or they can go to Southern Fried Lawyer dot com and they could they could uh, my phone number is 504-529-5000 i'm happy to talk to anyone that emails or calls and uh like to continue this discussion thank you it's been uh, wonderful having you on this podcast and it's been my blessing I, thank you it's been a pleasure and what does it mean for you to be on this podcast, Legal Angle? This is the very first podcast that I have ever been on. And it uh, it gives me that tremendous opportunity to share and spill my guts out that you've been so gracious to kind of let me talk without asking too terribly many questions. Um, but And I really do appreciate that. I guess I felt it was a little bit of therapy today. Uh, <laughs> but... I love this ability, this forum, to communicate with others who will listen and or watch this podcast and hopefully get something from it. It it allows me to have my first pulpit in my life on the internet. So Emmanuel, I am forever grateful for the invitation and the ability to be here with you today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And thanks again for for being here. And for those of you at home, either watching us or listening to this as a podcast, we thank you for your time. And remember to subscribe to us on Facebook, Instagram, and on the podcast itself, and to follow us on Instagram. Now, until next time, take care and stay blessed. Bye for now.